Hi, good evening, everyone. Thank you, Brenda. My name is Sarah Absher. I'm the director of the Tillamook County Department of Community Development. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Great. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. So yes, yeah, so I'm going to be very brief, and I'm going to circle back around to um, these uh, these pieces of information that I'm going to share with you to kind of provide some context to what we're going to be hearing from our panelists. Uh, but I'm going to go quickly in light of time. So um, goal 18, the focus of goal 18 is beaches and dunes and how that statewide planning goal trickles down into our comprehensive plan, uh, our zoning districts and allowable uses as well as our permitting processes is that in some areas, uh, development, which could be residential, commercial, or industrial, is allowed on dunes in some areas. In other areas, it's not allowed. And the focus of the dune is for protection. In all areas, it's very important to make sure that dunes are stabilized. And oftentimes, we do that through vegetation management. Dunes provide erosion and flood protection to properties and to our communities. They are the best natural barrier that we have. Sometimes in areas like Nescoan, um, where there is severe erosion, dunes are allowed to be um, riprapped or armored to stop erosion. But as you also know, uh, this does not mean that it stops ocean flooding. It's important to make sure we have public access to our beaches uh, and that recreation opportunities exist on our beaches. Our beaches and dunes are a valued natural resource they provide environmental, social, energy, and economic benefits. And with any type of development that occurs within our beaches and dunes, uh, this oftentimes requires permitting and it's permitting with um, partnering agencies on local, state, and federal levels. And with us tonight uh, as part of that discussion are two of our permitting agency partners and that is Jason Wald from OPRD and Meg Reed from DLCB. So I'm gonna stop there and go ahead and get ready to introduce our first um, panelist this evening. So um, this is going to be Dr. Peter Rogerio from Oregon State University. He is joining us via video uh, this evening with a clip that he prepared for all of you. And uh, what I personally appreciate about Dr. Ruggiero are his uh, efforts and scientific research in dune stabilization and monitoring. Uh, we talked a lot about vegetation management for stabilization with Dr. Ruggiero. He and his associates, this is one of their areas of expertise. And I anticipate Brenda, he will be sharing a lot of that with us here now. So uh, go ahead and uh, if you'd like to play the video, please. Thank you. Okay, um, so uh, I, am I sharing my screen now, Chris? Yes, you are. Yes. Okay, yes. so uh, ho hopefully the sound is good. I'm just gonna press the cord and if it's not, it doesn't work, someone get my attention because I don't know how we were actually gonna have someone else play it. So I'm just gonna hit record and hopefully you don't get like an echo or feedback or something. Here we go. Welcoming Peter Ruggiero from Oregon State University to talk to us about goal number 18. He's a subject matter expert in this area, and specifically, he helped on, uh, he was part of the team that worked on the Nescoan Coastal Erosion Adaption Plan. So, Peter, we ask you, in the context of the Nescoan citizens who are preparing to take their survey to develop their next 20 year community plan, what do we need to know about? Nescoan and coastal erosion. And goal 18. Hey, uh, well, thanks uh, for the question, uh, Brenda. And thanks for having me. Sorry, I can't be with you all tonight. Um, so as Brenda mentioned, my name is Peter Ruggiero from Oregon State University. I'm a, a coastal geomorphologist and a professor in the College of Earth, Ocean, and Atmospheric Science. <clears throat> so as uh, uh, Brenda mentioned, I've been uh, thinking about coastal change and coastal processes along the Oregon coast for quite some time. and was uh, happy to be part of the, uh, the kind of adaptation planning effort that took place uh, several years ago, working with several uh, folks from the, uh, from the Nesquan area. And so some, some of the things that um, my research group was able to kind of bring to the table uh, back then, along with uh, various other colleagues, were some observations of the trends of coastal uh, change that have been occurring 
along the coastline. And so documenting basically the rates of, of, of beach change, so that's kind of mapping out a shoreline position and seeing how that might evolve uh, historically and then uh, potentially into the future as well is kind of key to kind of addressing these kinds of things. Um, and so we've, we've uh, used a variety of different techniques to actually measure the shoreline position. Sometimes that's with aerial photographs. Sometimes it's extracting shoreline positions from air, airborne LIDAR data. Sometimes that's measurements on the ground. Uh, and so, you know, by the time they, the, the adaptation plan a few years ago was being developed, it was very clear uh, that the data was showing, and it's no surprise to folks uh, living in the, in the community that the erosion rates were uh, quite high and uh, you know, some of the highest in the states uh, in, in the state of Oregon on the order of several feet per year of, uh, of erosion over the course of a couple of, of decades. And uh, so we, we've been documenting that and actually documenting what that's been looking like over the last couple of decades as well. <clears throat> and in places that might have slowed down a little bit, um, but in, in some places the, the erosion rates are still uh, relatively high. And that's uh, hopefully, uh, I've got a master's student uh, finishing his degree this fall, hopefully we'll have a new product that will uh, uh, pr present basically the erosion rates for Beskowin uh, within the context of the rest of the uh, of the state. So that's that's one thing that just necessarily needs to happen. Um, and uh, my group does a little bit of that is in Jonathan Allen's group with uh, the Department of Geology and Mineral Industries also does quite a bit of uh, monitoring of beach changes uh, using underground techniques um, in the region. One other thing that we uh, didn't have a good handle on back uh, then a few years ago, but have a little put a, a better handle on now was a little bit more about the kind of interannual to decadal uh, cycles in terms of coastal change. I think it's been well known uh, in Oregon uh, for quite some time that El Ninos have a big impact on our coastal change rates. And so, you know, in particular, the 97, 98 El Nino had a very major impact in, in, in terms of nestling, in terms of uh, moving sediment from uh, the area kind of just north of Cascade Head, north up towards the Pacific City area. Um, and so that was something that was well documented, talked about quite a bit. Um, but there was a question that we had asked, because we saw in the data that that, that signal of the sediment of erosion in the south of, of Littoral Cell and movement to the north up towards places like Pacific City, that looked like, at least from the data, that it was sustained over more than just a single El Nino cycle. But it was actually something that was in the data over the course of a, a, a couple of decades. And so we did a, a, a student and I, a couple of years ago, did a modeling study that really was able to kind of suss out the fact that there are not just these kind of interannual cycles associated with El Ninos um, that really kind of enhance uh, the, the typical seasonal cycles, but there's actually multi-decadal cycles that we think might be driven by like, low frequency modulations in, in ENSO variability. So just meaning that that process of moving sediment from the area near Nestuin up towards the northern part of the, of the little south towards uh, Cape Gwanda, that process had uh, been actually uh, going on for a couple decades and really was enhanced by the 97, 98 El Nino, even in the 2015, 2016 El Nino as well. And so in, in some sense that uh, helped explain uh, maybe the, the magnitude of the, uh, of the problem in that southern part of this, this literal cell in Oregon. <clears throat> but it might actually also provide a little bit of, of potential good news. If, if this is a cycle that's happened in the past, because we, we all know that in uh, in Pacific City in the 1970s and 80s, um, there was a, an erosion problem. And back in that uh, time period, Nestlin had a lot more sand uh, on the beaches and dunes. And so there's at least the potential that that natural cycle will, will repeat itself and that there might be a, a possibility of, of some sediment from the north moving back to the south. Now, I don't want to, I don't know, let it make a specific prediction, but I'm, all I'm saying is that we documented that this looks like it's happened a couple of times in the historical record and might be seeing something like that into the future. <clears throat> Obviously, other things that uh, folks in Nesquim uh, kind of need to uh, keep in mind kind of thinking into the future with adaptation planning out for 20 years is that we're experiencing a, a range of kind of climate impacts on our, our beaches and dunes. Um, so you know, the most obvious one is obviously sea level rise. Uh, you know, we've had relatively modest sea level rise rates to date, um, but unfortunately those are projected on, on virtually every scenario uh, due to greenhouse gas emissions, subsequent uh, melting of, of ice sheets and glaciers, et cetera, warming of the oceans. Now those rates are starting to increase, they've been documented to be increasing and they're going to continue to increase. Over time scales of 20 years, it's really hard to make specific predictions. 
But the bottom line is that's going to continue to uh, show up as kind of an effective shoreline retreat as the water gets uh, uh, closer to the infrastructure. Much of the, uh, the nestling shoreline is obviously already armored with riprap revetments. And so uh, by definition, that typically results in a, you know, what often referred to as beach squeeze or kind of a less of an accessible beach. Um, and so that's just something to keep in mind that that might be that's something that might be occurring over the course of the next couple of decades, certainly over multiple decades, uh, well up towards the uh, mid-century and beyond. Uh, this is something that's going to become a major uh, potential problem in many uh, locations within the Oregon coast, um, if not balanced by natural sediment supply and or uh, other adaptation uh, measures like um, beach nourishment, or dune, um, dune restoration projects, et cetera, um, along the Neskum coast where there's a lot of armoring that might mean that the, uh, the, the height of the, uh, of the riprap structures might need to be enhanced uh, to keep the flooding uh, to a minimum. It might mean that the maintenance costs that are already being incurred on an annual basis by the community, those might need to be increased as, as well. Um, I know at the time of that Neskum plan, there was a, a concerted effort, or at least a discussion, uh, about whether it was possible to both maintain protection of the uh, coastal of, of the infrastructure, so the, you know, the private property behind the uh, uh, the, the riprap revetments, but also to keep and sustain a, a healthy, safe, uh, walkable uh, beach. And I, I'm sure that's still an issue uh, today. And you know, again, you know, the, the, the possibilities there are natural sediment supply by the cycles that I talked about earlier. Again, kind of getting back to discussions about uh, beach nourishment projects, um, I know those were discussed a lot the last during the last round of adaptation planning. Um, there's a lot of complications associated with that, but uh, certainly something that's a, a potential possibility. Um, uh, all this obviously needing to happen within the context of uh, of goal 18 and how that is used to manage the uh, the region's beaches and dunes. I guess I'll, I'll point out um, a couple of other uh, fairly kind of exciting things from the perspective of at least kind of understanding and monitoring coastal processes. There's a bit of a variety of efforts in recent years um, to use uh, other remote sensing techniques to get uh, a little bit more uh, high frequency and time measurements of shorelines. And so in particular, uh, people have developed uh, methodologies to extract shoreline positions uh, from and, and, and also metrics like beach slope from uh, from satellite imagery, and so this allows us to kind of go back um, potentially through the satellite record, maybe through the mid '80s, and get more um, frequent um, observations of, of where the shoreline has been. You know, in this one, we actually have a pretty good sense of the of that historical evolution of what the shoreline has been doing over the last couple of decades. But this can fill in some of the gaps and you know get us a little bit more detail on. Kind of seasonal um, interannual variability. Uh, but the nice thing about that, uh, that maybe improved ability to uh, get high resolution and time data for um, parts of the Oregon coast is that can feed into models that are probably a little bit more um, useful in terms of making some at least uh, basic projections about what the future might hold. And as you imagine, you know, to project anything in the future, those are typically very Kind of stochastic or probabilistic estimates of shoreline position. Uh, you know, you have to look at a variety of different scenarios, what the sea level will do, what the wave climate might look like. But at the very least, I think we're going to take a, a shot at making some projections for various locations along the Oregon coast using that satellite imagery to help build the, the models and then some ability to, to uh, project the future of the, uh, of the physical processes to, to give us an estimate of what the shoreline might be in the future. And all, you know, the reason to bring that up is that those kinds of projections, at least um, they might have you know, large error bars on them, lots of uncertainty, but that's also something that's relatively useful when you're considering uh, the various uh, ways of, of kind of managing uh, shorelines and dunes in terms of thinking about how much accessible beach there will be in the future, um, what height uh, armory might need to be to kind of, uh, keep uh, flooding at a minimum, um, you know, how often dunes will be impacted, those kinds of uh, questions. So the, 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 that kind of scientific information hopefully will be, will be made usable for uh, these kinds of adaptation uh, decisions going into the future. Um, I guess the, other, the only other uh, thing I'll add is that, um, you know, myself and, and many other colleagues uh, at OSU and other institutions within the region have uh, been 
you know, able to uh, uh, work on several interesting um, you know, funded research projects that are thinking about these issues of coastal change, um, about the various uh, ecosystem services that beaches and dunes provide. And we often use Tillamook County kind of in general and, and sometimes the Nesquim Little Cell as a particular um, kind of area to kind of explore our models and our data collection in, in detail. So several of these projects are, are ongoing and we've got some new ones in the works. And so um, I think the thing that I can commit to is that we'll have some at least research um, interests uh, from the Oregon State uh, University side in along these beaches for some time. So happy to answer any questions. Um, that may come up, but thanks very much for your time. And again, sorry to be there in person today. Thanks. Thank you, Peter. That was excellent. Um, Chris, do you have any questions? No, no, I don't. Not at this time. I thought that was a very thorough um, explanation of, of um, what's going on around here. Excellent. Yeah. Um, I, I, you know, I have a couple of questions since <laughs> since we have you. And and then as because I was looking at the coastal erosion plan, and since I'm like a planner, I was thinking as a community. I, I it, first of all, I'm hearing you say there's going to be a lot of variability, so there's no way to really know what's going to happen over the next 20 years, other than that things are going to change, right? And it's likely that the sea level will rise. I mean, that's kind of what I hear. <laughs> and and then there's a whole bunch of other variables. There's the sea level will rise, and there's a bunch of other variables. So as a community, we want to plan for those things, like you said, um, you know, having a beach to walk on and at least having the houses there, not go off into the ocean, et cetera. So uh, what is your advice and like if, how, to, how to plan for any cost estimates or cost projections, like even to just make a fund? Because, or, you know, is there creative ways or what are your thoughts like how we might prepare for that because it sounds like we don't know what we're going to have to pay for in terms of maintenance because there's so many variables but how could what would your advice be if you have any else how can we come to get, to get together as a community and kind of plan for knowing that we're going to have to pay something mm -hmm. over the next 20 years but we don't know what it's going to be because you know no one wants to fund something without an estimate so yeah. It's a great question, and I, and I think uh, you know, the best you can do in this situation when you're, you know, basically have um, fixed private infrastructure along a, uh, a very dynamic setting. So this is this is not something unique to uh, Nexplan. Obviously, it's uh, many many communities around the country, around the world, deal with this exact same thing. I think the best thing you can do is, is plan for a variety of scenarios. And uh, so, in in all the, the previous projects that we've done that have incorporated uh, kind of interacting with, with folks in, in your community. We've explored kind of a, a low end sea level rise rate, potentially uh, you know, modest changes to the wave climate that might um, bring more sediment uh, to the system all the way to the, the more extreme ends in terms of what sea level rise and the worst case uh, wave climate is. The, the bottom line is that it's a, a very dynamic, uncertain, stochastic system. And so the, the, uh, the things that are gonna drive the costs that um, Associated with these hazards are going to be, um, it's, it's a very probabilistic answer. And so you have to explore that, you know, that low end to the high end and then, and then make a decision as a community uh, what you want to actually plan for. Um, but I, I think it's, it's uh, unfortunately, um, the, the chances of things uh, getting better are probably smaller than the, uh, the chances of things getting worse in, in, in terms of more uh, coastal flooding. More impact of you know, waves against the uh, of the revetments, um, less walkable beaches. That's the trends, the, you know, the multi-decadal trend that's been experiencing, and that's what sea level rise will continue to bring. All those other things give you kind of you know short-term variability. Um, you know, the, the one caveat being if, if that multi-decadal cycle of sediment supply that I mentioned, if that changes, but again, that's not a prediction. That's just you know, what's happened in the past. Um, and if, if it happens in the, in the future, then Nesquim will be in a little bit better shape, but that's still um, going to have to be balanced against sea level rise. So unfortunately, I don't have a great answer to you. I think that talking to other communities that, that deal with this kind of thing, um, you know, a lot of times those other communities they'll have a, a you know, quite a, a large uh, tax base and, and, uh, and tourist industry. And, uh, so I know there's many communities that are on the North Carolina coast 
Uh, Carteret County, uh, North Carolina, for example, uh, it has had the ability to basically fund their beach nourishment programs for a couple of decades. And I think that they do that with a variety of different um, kind of community um, taxes. Um, and you know, that's oftentimes something that a lot of folks don't want to hear, hear or think about, but it's, it's actually worked quite well in parts of the country. Whereas they've spent, I think, you know, many, you know, probably tens of millions of dollars on beach uh, material for nourishment um, by you know, having a system where they, they uh, basically be able to develop their own funding source. Now, of course, it's a bigger community. It's in, a, in an area that's much lower energy, that's you know, they're subject to hurricanes and uh, tropical storms. And we're not here in, uh, in Nesquim. But unfortunately, I think as most people know, the weather window for doing beach nourishment is, is small. The, sand sources are limited and just even having equipment uh, that can do that kind of work is something that is, is limited on, the, on our part of the country which is why we don't do it that often. thank you thank you that i know it's a challenging question but that was an excellent answer i mean you gave us a lot to think about as a community you know i'm hearing you say well you know plan for a variety understand there's going to be variability and plan for something i guess we just have to as a community come together and decide what level we're going to plan for and how we're gonna fund it. And I just I just think that's really important that we keep communicating about it and not not plan just because it's hard to plan for. You know, so I guess we'll continue to seek advice on that. Thanks, Chris. Did any other questions come up? Uh, um, yeah, one, one question did come to mind. Peter, you spoke about the shifting of sand between Nesquim and Pacific City over the decades and that the shift will reverse. Do we have evidence that that shift is starting to reverse or are we continuing to see the sand shift to the north? Yeah, I, I, first I'm not gonna uh, go out on a limb and make a, a prediction here. We, we, um, we, we've documented that there's been a couple of these cycles in the past, uh, but not enough evidence to, to demonstrate that it's reversed. Um, I think we were hoping there was some indication of that, uh, that cycle happening again, but it kind of, it's, it slowed down again. And I guess my, my main point is that I think it, it explains the, the reversal of fortunes between Pacific City and, and Nesquim over the last couple of decades. Um, but um, yeah, I think we will have to wait and see to determine whether or not that's going to happen in the future. Great, thanks. All right. Well, thank you so much, Peter. I don't have any additional questions today. Do you have any final comments um, before I conclude the recording? No. Uh, uh. Great. Thank you, Brenda. Uh, I believe that wraps up the conversation with Dr. Uh, Rogerio. Is that correct? Yes, please take it back, Sarah. I'm just trying to Thank turn you. it all off from my end. It's back to you, and we have to get to Meg soon, and then, then uh, Everyone, everyone else is here. Okay, I, thank you. Back to you, Sarah. Thank you. So right on time with the 6.30 time starting, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Meg Reed, the Coastal Shore Specialist from the Department of Land Conservation and Development. Welcome, Meg. Thank you, Sarah. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Thank you. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, I have some slides. Is it okay if I share my screen? Sure. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Great, and I apologize, I can't show my video because I don't have enough USB ports on my laptop, so I have to pick and choose which ones I use. So, um, uh, so I'm using my headset instead. Uh, but yes, uh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, my name is Meg Reed. I'm the Coastal Shore Specialist for the Oregon Department of Land Conservation and Development. As Sarah mentioned, I'm based in Newport, Oregon, um, and I'm the subject matter ex expert for the department on the goal, on goal 18 beaches and dunes. Um, so I just, uh, I'm just going to take a few minutes just to kind of give you the basics of the goal and then talk a little bit about um, some things that we're doing as a department to address sea level rise and things that we, we might be able to have provide as resources to you. And then I'm happy to answer any questions that come up. Um, so there's sort of, as, as Sarah mentions, the whole purpose of the goal is to protect 
beach and dune areas and also to protect development in these areas to ensure that it happens in areas that um, are more stabilized and are far from the hazards of coastal erosion and flooding and such like that and protect the beach environment as well as protect the public beach for all Oregonians. Um, so it was passed with all of the other coastal goals in the late 70s. They were uh, the I, I think you've been sort of going through all the goals, so I won't be, uh, belabor that point, but 16 through 19 are the final statewide planning goals, and they're all focused on coastal resources. Um, and so there are three main points that Goal 18 does, and they're the ones that come up the most often for local governments. Um, one, well, I guess I should say there are four. One is that you need to inventory the beach and dune areas. Um, and so this is something that we are working on um, right now with Tillamook County um, because the inventory for most jurisdictions is very old. It's from 1975. And we know that these areas are very dynamic. And so we actually were um, able to partner with Dogami and Jonathan might talk about this a little bit later, but we um, did update the inventory for Tillamook County as a pilot project about a year, a year and a half ago. And so we will be working through to get that adopted into the county's planning very soon. Um, but then the second uh, main point is prohibition areas. So this is areas that are off limits to development because they're too hazardous to build on. So think areas that are prone to ocean flooding and undercutting. Um, and then secondly, or thirdly, we have dune grading requirements. And this is not really necessarily an issue in Neskowin because you're experiencing erosion. But in other areas, um, say, in Pacific City, where they're experiencing the opposite sand inundation, there are some very strict requirements around how people can lower the height of the foredune in order to improve ocean views. Um, it used to be prohibited outright, but then um, when the goals were originally adopted, people were doing it anyway. And so our commission got together with some experts and came up with some guidelines for how we can keep the integrity of the dune in place, um, that it's really important to have really good dune width, as well as stabilization with things like beach grass to really keep the dune properties in place to protect human development behind those dunes from erosion and flooding. And then lastly, the major component of the goal is about beachfront protective structure limitations. So those areas that are rip-wrapped, um, the only areas that were developed as of January 1st, 1977 are allowed to be protected with a beachfront protective structure. Any areas that were developed after that date have to incorporate non-structural components to protect from coastal erosion hazards. So that could be setbacks from the ocean or sand nourishment or other non-structural types of techniques. Um, and then development in this case is defined as houses, commercial industrial buildings, and vacant but improved sub subdivision lots. And in the case of Neskowin, in most of the area, but not all. Um, there is also a goal exception to um, a large portion of the area to that prohibition area because the houses that existed were already built on the foredune in what would otherwise be prohibited under the goal. And so there was an exception that was taken when the comprehensive plan was first developed by the county. And that also gives an exception to the beachfront protective structure limitation. So those areas as you already know, are already rip-wrapped and they're allowed to because of that exception process. Um, I wanted to show this example of the importance of Goal 18 on our landscape. Um, so this is not Nesquin, but it's Pacific City nearby. Um, and you can see that there's an area that um, is pointed to with a red arrow that's pre-Goal 18 development. So that was areas that were developed before the goal went into place. And you can very clearly see that those areas are inundated by sand because they're on the top of the foredune. Whereas the area just to the north um, with the blue arrow is post-Goal 18 development so that had to be built behind the dune in an area that was more stabilized and so there is a dune in front of that complex that is stabilized and vegetated and so those properties are not being inundated by sand so you can see that there is really a lot of valid point into and in why the goal 18 is put out there to protect the beaches and dunes but also to protect human infrastructure and development 
Um, the eligibility inventory that we have is online in case anyone's interested. It might not be as exciting for those in Nesquin because uh, you do have that goal exception, but there's also a lot of other hazard information there so that you can view it. It's publicly accessible. It's on our coastal atlas, which, which hosts a number of really great resources that anyone can go and look to. So it could be a really great resource for you as you continue down this um, community plan update. And it hosts um, the eligibility inventory of who is eligible for those future and protective structures and not, as well as where they already exist on the Oregon coast, uh, FEMA flood maps, erosion hazard zones, the tsunami inundation zones, literal cell boundaries, wetland inventories, and so on. So you can find that at coastal, uh, the Oregon Coastal Atlas. <clears throat> and then I wanted to just share a few um, statistics just because I thought maybe you might be interested in them. This is coastwide data, um, so it's not just specific to your community, um, but uh, uh, there. Uh, we compiled some of this information um, this year and so wanted to share that about 22.7 miles of Oregon's coastline is already armored, which is about 6% of the overall coastline. And that's a pretty low number, com especially compared to other coastal states that have a lot more armoring. So that's good um, that we're, we're keeping it fairly low. 92% um, of that armoring is located in Clatsop, Tillamook and Lincoln counties. Um, and that's not surprising because that is where the most people live on the coast and you might think of the south coast there's actually a lot of public land on the ocean front um, and and so there's just not a lot of development that's at risk to erosion and therefore doesn't need to be armored um, 84 percent of the coast is not eligible for armoring under current policies um, and but there is still a lot of coastline that could be armored into the future and that's important for us to consider, uh, especially in terms of climate change and accessibility of the public beach which Dr. Ruggiero talked about. Um, so eligible and unarmored lots account for about 42 miles of the coast. So if all of those become armored that will definitely increase the amount of armoring coastwide. So that's kind of the gist of goal 18. Um, I'm happy to take questions and just wanted to mention a few uh, things sort of focus more on the adaptation to climate change. How are we thinking about addressing the impacts of sea level rise? Um, so we do have um, a, a resource that's also on our coastal atlas. This one's called the sea level rise exposure inventory for Oregon's estuaries. Um, so this is specific to goal 16 areas, goal 16, goal 17, and um, the estuarine areas. So it's not not necessarily as applicable in your community, but it's still useful for areas nearby. Um, and this was an assessment that was done using um, different sea level rise scenarios for 2030, 2050, and 2100 in all of Oregon's major estuaries. Um, and it looked at exposure of certain critical assets to those sea level rise scenarios on top of a 1% and a 50% uh, chance flood events. Um, and so they, you could see assets such as roads, railroads, roads, airports, schools, city halls, things like that. What is at risk under these different sea level rise scenarios? So it's a pretty good data set to um, start the conversation of what's vulnerable to these, uh, to the effects of sea level rise. And similarly, we're actually underway with creating a sea level rise planning guide that's targeted to local governments and local planners um, on the Oregon coast that will um, give a sea level rise plan planning boundary. So we're putting on a map, a polygon of the areas that we uh, think will be potentially impacted by sea level rise, both on the outer coast and through the estuaries, and then give a, a process that local governments might follow with their communities to identify the people and assets that are at risk of those hazards and coming up with some different adaptation strategies, both within our existing regulatory framework, and then also po possibly thinking about policy changes that might be needed to keep us moving forward into uh, this new future under climate change impacts. So we're working on that now, and we're hoping to roll it out to coastal planners this coming fall, and then get some feedback and revise it as needed, and then have it finalized by the end of this calendar year. So that's it for me, but again, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, Meg. Um, 
we will circle back around uh, for questions at the end. Um, I don't know if there's anything in the chat for Meg quickly uh, before she departs. Yeah, um, I'm, not, I'm not seeing any chats. Uh, okay. Any, any questions in the chat, chat room yet? Yeah. And if anything comes up, um, Meg and I talk frequently. So if something comes up later, then I am happy to relay that to Meg and, and then get an answer back to the group. So thank you so much, Meg. Yes, thank you. Sorry, I have to yeah, run sure. early, but my toddler has to go to bed. So <laughs> thank you for your grace. Have a good night, Meg. Thank you, Meg. Thank you. Uh, so next, it is my pleasure to introduce Jonathan Allen. He's the coastal geomorphologist from the Oregon Department of Geology and Mineral Industry, Kagami. Uh, Jonathan and I actually have been working together on various Sierra County coastal issues for several years. And uh, he's always a pleasure to work with and a great resource for Tillamook County. So thank you for joining us this evening, John. I'll go ahead and turn the floor over to you. Sure. Good evening. And uh, thank you also for inviting me along today. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to um, uh, just speak a little bit about uh, the work that we um, are involved in uh, with respect to uh, dealing with um, coastal um, geologic hazards, uh, as well as um, some risk assessment type studies that we've been working on uh, for some time now uh, over much of the Oregon coast and especially in, in, in around Tillamook County. Um, for those of you who, who uh, don't know me, um, uh, I'm a, my background's in coastal geomorphology. I've been working on the Oregon coast now for um, uh, about 22 years, uh, so it seems like a long time. And um, uh, I've been involved in, in uh, numerous studies uh, relating to um, understanding uh, the geologic hazards throughout Tillamook County and also, also obviously in other locations up and down the Oregon coast. Um, I'll just give you a little bit of background about my agency. Uh, so we don't actually have uh, any regulatory responsibility um, in terms of uh, uh, permitting uh, engineering structures or um, building regulations or anything like that related to the Oregon coast. Uh, we are founded on science and um, we uh, focus on providing uh, good quality uh, geologic hazard information uh, for others to utilize um, to obviously assist with making uh, sound decisions in obviously very dynamic uh, parts of our state. Um, as an agency, we're, we've been focused on uh, really four, uh, four or five key areas. Um, these relate to uh, general earth science issues. Um, hazards is obviously a very big part of the work that we do, um, particularly as it relates to uh, landslides uh, and um, coastal erosion, uh, as well as obviously uh, tsunami um, risk. Uh, we also have a very active uh, mapping program that uh, uh, maps out uh, the underlying geology, uh, which obviously has um, a bearing on um, you know, water uh, issues, uh, resource assessments, and uh, uh, et cetera. And then we also have a very active um, airborne LIDAR uh, program for the cons consolidation of, of uh, high resolution um, aerial topography of a coastline and uh, state uh, for um, uh, obviously being able to delineate uh, geologic land, uh, hazard features such as landslides, um, but also be able uh, so that we can actually integrate into um, sophisticated models for tsunami inundation map mapping and modeling, as well as coastal uh, erosion hazard assessments. So um, our field office was established in 1999, uh, so we're based here in Newport. Uh, and actually, one of the, the, the initial tasks that were assigned to us was actually to uh, work with Tillamook County in 2001 to map out uh, coastal erosion hazard zones for uh, the entire county coastline. And so we actually completed that, um, and we focused on a variety of deterministic scenarios. Uh, with the end result being the production of hazard maps that de delineate uh, responses uh, that range from high risk zones down to uh, moderate through to low risk zones. And these uh, hazard maps were really driven by 
an understanding of the extreme wave climate that impacts our, our um, coastline, as well as um, an attempt to, at the time, to accommodate factors such as uh, sea level rise uh, that was being forecasted at the time for the future. So those, those maps are actually utilized by the county um, and uh, primarily as, a, as a, um, a triggering mechanism for more site-specific type uh, studies. Um, that are undertaken by geotechnical consultants for um, issues relating to uh, erosion happening at a particular house, and obviously uh, what's the what's the um, uh, end game for those types of situations, and obviously uh, feeding into concerns over riprap and and uh, shoreline protection and things like that. Uh, we've also done a lot of work uh, with respect to uh, flood inundation modelling. Peter and I worked. Uh, very extensively over about a five-year period, um, uh, mapping and modeling tsunami inundation, uh, sorry, not tsunami, co coastal flood inundation uh, for Tillamook County and obviously other counties up and down the Oregon coast uh, to revise the, the FEMA flood maps that were actually originally uh, mapped in the 1970s. And so the goal there was obviously to utilize um, uh, updated uh, oceanographic information, both in terms of extreme waves as well as uh, sea level conditions uh, to try to forecast um, the risk of flood um, along our coastline. And then um, probably one of the key pieces of, of uh, uh, data sets that we um, utilize stems from a monitoring program that I established in 2004 to begin to document the seasonal to interannual variability and change on our beaches. And so, uh, we established the um, Oregon Beach Shoreline Monitoring Network, uh, which actually covers uh, much of Tillamook County, including Nesquin all the way up to Pacific City, uh, the Neetard Cell, and also up in the, the Rockaway Cell, extending all the way up to uh, Manzanita. And so we've actually been monitoring um, a whole suite of stations now um, on a seasonal basis. We come out three times a year, um, effectively, uh, late summer, uh, late, uh, sorry, late summer, uh, fall, which is around December timeframe, and late winter to pick up the changes um, that are, are attributed to obviously wave and sea level changes that take place between uh, summer winter conditions. And so we've actually been doing this now for a long time and we have data extending back through to the late 1990s, which gives us about a 24 year timeframe of um, very high resolution data about the changes that are taking place on our beaches um, and including obviously uh, in Nesquin all the way up through Pacific City. And those data sets can, can tell us a lot about um, uh, the role of extreme storms and driving change, but also the, the variability that takes place from one location relative to another as to um, where the sand may be moving and, and uh, uh, questions like that. And then as, as Meg um, indicated most recently, uh, one of the, the uh, tasks we worked on with um, uh, Meg's team and, and Sarah was obviously updating the uh, uh, beach in June inventory for all of Tillamook County as part of a pilot study. This, this work was originally done in the 1970s. Uh, and as you all are aware, there's been a lot of change since then. And, and so the goal here was to um, evaluate uh, the changes that have taken place using uh, more up-to-date information uh, that can be derived from aerial photography, but in particular utilizing um, our high resolution uh, airborne LIDAR data to better delineate um, the changes that have taken place uh, in our beaches and dunes along the county there. And obviously that's a, a very critical piece of, of um, uh, data going forward that the county is using to uh, um, revise their their uh, future planning guidelines. Um, and uh, so in terms of, of um, obviously uh, preventative measures going forward into the future, I mean, there's a lot of existing information available to, uh, uh, to utilize and, and help guide in terms of decision-making. Um, and Peter touched on obviously the science with respect to uh, changes in extreme waves and, and future forecasts and sea level rise. And so a lot of that information is, is available today and, and um, is, is constantly being updated as, as new science um, is made available to us. And you know, I, I was just looking at uh, a 
future forecasts of sea level rise um, using the National Research Council forecast back in 2012, which was at the time uh, the best available measurements and forecasts uh, for uh, the Oregon coast. And those data have already been updated as part of a more recent study um, completed in 2017. And so as the science evolves, uh, we need to be obviously responsive to those um, new data sets and be able to integrate them into uh, future forecasts. And Peter's team is obviously doing a, a tremendous job in, in um, being able to utilize those, those types of data sets. So I'll stop there and, and uh, happy to take questions later on um, uh, as you uh, see fit. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Appreciate it. Uh, we're going to go ahead and keep moving forward. Um, can you stay on for the duration of the meeting in case there's any questions at the end? Thank you. I, I, I think you said should. <laughs> so moving forward, uh, our next panelist is Jay Senewald. Uh, Jay is also a former land use planner and has served as the Ocean Shores Coordinator for the Oregon Parks and Recreation Department. Welcome, Jay. Thank you for joining us tonight. Hi, hey, Sarah. And uh, first, I want to thank you and the Nesquin community for inviting me to join you tonight. Um, I'm planning on just sharing with you a short presentation on ocean shore management. Uh, some of that is relevant to, to Nesquin. Uh, the rest of it is generally uh, in regards to ocean shore regulations and permit processes. And so um, if you have specific questions about the ocean shore management or permitting related to Nesquin, I guess I can address uh, those questions later on. Uh, so if it's okay, I'd like to share my screen. And I'll move through it fairly quickly. I think I have 20 slides. And can you see this? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. So I'm calling this um, Ocean Shores Management 101. So state parks has a key management responsibility for Oregon's beaches set forth in statute and rule. There's 362 miles of shoreline that we have management responsibility for, and we share management responsibility uh, with other partners, uh, state, local, and federal, but we have the primary responsibility. Um, so it's all based on Oregon's Beach Bill enacted in 1967, which gave the public free and uninterrupted use of all the beaches. Uh, and it's, um, administers as the Ocean Shore State Recreation Area. That's the official term in rule. And so State Parks is charged with the protection and preservation of the recreation, scenic, natural, cultural, and historic resource values that we have. So uh, the jurisdictional boundary changes over time with erosion uh, based on the definition of the ocean shore, which means the land lying between extreme low tide of the Pacific Ocean and the statutory vegetation line as described in ORS 39770, or the line of established upland shore vegetation, whichever is further landward. So what that means is as erosion happens and the beaches move, um, our jurisdiction moves with the beaches to make sure that the public can continue to enjoy their right to recreate on the ocean shore. So this little diagram shows us uh, how Private property intersects with the beach. Uh, oftentimes people believe um, incorrectly that state parks owns the beach. In many cases, and in fact, most cases in developed areas, property ownership may extend down to the high tide line of the Pacific Ocean, the mean high tide line. The beach bill actually established a public recreation easement over private property. And to avoid takings issues on challenges, uh, basically, property owners are exempt from property tax on their portion of their property along the ocean shore because of their reduced rights for usage and development purposes. So here's a, a bleak air photo, which sort of shows where a property tax lot might reach down to the high tide line. And you can see the line of vegetation, which is our jurisdiction. And the portion of the open sand beach is a portion of the property where the owner does not pay taxes. So, 
the agency administers permits for alterations of the ocean shore. Uh, most of us are familiar from Nesquin, at least most of us are familiar with shoreline protection structures, otherwise known as riprap. We also issue emergency permits, uh, permits for beach access ways, sand alteration and dune grading, which is something people in uh, Pacific City are familiar with, and also pipelines, cables, and conduits, including Trans-Pacific cable landings. Uh, shoreline protection structures. Uh, we have structural uh, approaches such as riprap seen here in this photograph. Uh, there uh, it would also include seawalls, concrete, wood and metal walls, and even jetties are considered uh, a structural shoreline protection structure. There are also bioengineered or softer structures um, or a mix of hard and soft approaches using natural materials, uh, soil burritos, uh, gabions, and so on and so forth. And there's, there's, there's non-structural ones, uh, which might include cobble placement, uh, sand nourishment or sand placement that uh, Jonathan Allen uh, mentioned earlier, um, driftwood placement or vegetative approaches to stabilizing the shoreline. So here's an example of riprap. Uh, this happens to be in the Glen Eden Beach area in Lincoln County, not too far away. Uh, this is an example of a concrete seawall. This one is at Nye Beach in Newport. It's been there for uh, well over 80 years, I believe, and it's uh, withstood the test of time. And then this one is a dynamic revetment uh, using natural materials along the shoreline. Uh, this is at Cape Lookout State Park. This was sort of an ex experimental project that's been largely successful. Uh, I believe it was implemented originally in Jonathan might be able to help me with the date, but it was in the uh, early 2000s. And it was recently, uh, there was some repair work done to it to keep it in good shape, uh, but it's performed remarkably well. A lot of people don't realize this is an artificial uh, approach to shoreline protection. They don't even realize it when they're using the beach, which is wonderful. Uh, it's in stark contrast to what we see in, in our typical riprap um, arrangement. So uh, here's some examples of public access ways or private access ways. You can see uh, basically private public, uh, all public access ways that have a landing or structural encroachment onto the ocean shore, uh, they all require permits. And we partner with uh, a lot of local jurisdiction governments, uh, county and city governments for public access ways. We also issue numerous private access stairways up and down the coast. Here's one more example of a public access way. This one's in Brookings. So sand alterations are another type of uh, activity and alteration of the shoreline, which is um, state parks cooperates with local government. Tillamook County has a four dune grading plan for the Pacific City shoreline uh, south of Cape Kiwanda, goes all the way down to Straub Park. These types of projects require close coordination between state parks and the local government. Uh, under goal 18, sand alterations may only occur in areas where the local government, in this case, Tillamook County at Pacific City has adopted a four dune management plan. And these plans require that four dune management um, practices occur in a large scale area and not on a piecemeal lot by lot basis because that doesn't work. This has to require that several property owners come together uh, and share the costs and share the responsibility of uh, shoreline stabilization, stabilizing the dunes with vegetative cover at the end of the grading projects. But this is just uh, an example of how that gets done. So pipelines, cables, or conduits are also regulated and require permits. This also includes stormwater outfalls, um, which can be problematic uh, because of the potential conflicts with the environment, uh, oils and stormwater runoff that can cause problems uh, where the public comes in contact with those. So uh, we're working with the city of Cannon Beach right now to get some permits for some stormwater outfalls that they need to have extended on the ocean shore. Uh, so this is just another example of the type of things that OPRD uh, has permitting authority over. So any shoreline alteration, most shoreline alterations require permits. As I mentioned, state parks does not exempt itself from permit requirements. Uh, the agency goes through the same process that the public has to go through. And most recently, 
uh, I had to write a permit for one of our parks uh, in your community up there um, at Sand Lake at, at the new state park there. And uh, that the purpose of that project was for the management of snowy plovers, which is an endangered species of birds. So when we look at permit evaluations, we evaluate several factors, project need, alterations and modifications. Are there alternatives to the project that would cause less problem or less have less impact on public recreation and safety, for example? Uh, other things that could be done to, to better accomplish the goals of the, of the property owner without causing negative impacts to the beach. Uh, projects should always be designed to minimize damage to the scenic attraction of the ocean shore. It cannot be a detriment to recreation use or access along the shoreline. We consider long-term structural stability and structural safety to make sure that things won't fall apart. And we don't end up with yards of concrete laying on the beach as junk that, uh, that's difficult to remove. Uh, we look at how it can minimize damage to natural resources, fish and wildlife habitat, uh, cultural resources. People don't realize oftentimes that the tribes have a strong interest in uh, potential cultural sites, ar archaeological sites along the shoreline because that's where the native peoples live. So uh, this might uh, look familiar to you. This is a section of shoreline at Neskowin. Uh, during an emergency situation, we issue emergency permits when there's not enough time to go through the regular shoreline permitting process. And uh, we can issue emergency permits on a minute's notice when it's warranted and when there's actually emer an emergency. An emergency is defined as a, as a situation where it's likely that property will be severely damaged or destroyed before the time it takes to get a regular permit through the, through the regular process. So uh, I covered this already. Uh, the thing about emergency permits is that the property owners require to come back within one year and convert the emergency permit to a regular ocean shore alteration permit. In most cases, this is a riprap type of uh, situation and I need, I need to shoreline to protect the shoreline from a severe case of erosion where it happens all at once. So here's another example of an emergency situation. This is also in Glen Eden Beach. Uh, where it's pretty obvious there's a problem and if something isn't done that it's that home would be lost. So the agency also, also issues other types of permits. Drive on beach permits is one. There's all sorts of good reasons for vehicles to be on the beach when otherwise they're not allowed. Construction purposes for riprap, uh, riprap repair, dune grading I mentioned earlier. Uh, Access for disabled individuals. Sometimes you might see somebody driving down the beach with a handicap uh, uh, sticker or flag flying off of their ATV because they can't have reasonable access to the shoreline based on their disability. And we also issue drive on beach permits for other things like special use permits, scientific research, commercial filming, uh, weddings, and so on and so forth. Uh, that flag you should see flying if somebody's uh, disabled or has mobility challenges on the beach. We do put strict limitations on how far people can go so to avoid user conflicts. And then there's also remedial sand removal permits. This also applies to uh, Tillamook County primarily in Pacific City where homes have been damaged by sand inundation. Sand actually fills crawl spaces and plumbing vents and can, can create extensive damage and rot. Uh, if the sand's not kept away. So that's another reason why we would issue permits for equipment to operate on the beach to remove this type of uh, sand from this type of situation. Here's another example of uh, after remedial sand removal activities have taken place. This is an example of riprap construction. This one happens to also be in Tillamook County at Rockaway Beach. Uh, this rap, riprap was installed in 2017 and it's holding up quite well but you can see that it causes a disruption of the beach and you can understand why the public uh, might have concerns about what's going on on the beach and the impacts that riprap has on, on recreation and scenic values and so on. There's other types of things going on on the beach. A lot of people don't think about boat uh, strandings, uh, cars getting stuck uh, below the high tide line. You never know what's coming. Whales washing up on the beach, although we no longer blow them up. And I think that's just gonna conclude my short presentation. And like I say, I'll hold off for questions until uh, everybody else has had a chance and I'll be back with you. 
Thank you so much, Jay. Much appreciated. Uh, Commissioner Yamamoto. Uh, so to uh, introduce our final panelist of this evening, it is my pleasure to introduce County Commissioner David Yamamoto. Thank you, Commissioner, for joining us. Well, thank you so much. I thought Doug Olson was going to be here. Apparently not. He's on the agenda anyway. Um, but um, so is, is that incorrect? Uh, I did see Mr. Olson. Yes, he is. He is on the the meeting. Yes. So I no. thought he was a presenter. No, he's not. Sorry. He's no, that was a mistake. He was on an earlier agenda, but he's oh. not on the slide. He wasn't on okay. today's. It was a misunderstanding that he told us. Unfortunately, he couldn't make it. So um, that was just a misunderstanding. So, so you are bringing it on home for us, Commissioner. Uh, I am Tillamook County Commissioner Dave Yamamoto. I live in Pacific City. Uh, I'm probably the least qualified to be on this August group. Um, but I have had I have many years now of uh, ocean policy issues. Uh, I think we all know that the sand is coming from Nescoin, is going to Pacific City, and eventually that will turn around. There's no doubt about that. Uh, I remember homes in in Pacific City being inundated with sand, and, and that that's why Jay Sandoval showed that uh, that that the two photos of of um, beach unnourishment, if you want to call it that, where we're actually taking sand away from the homes. Uh, I've been in homes where the dunes in front of these beachfront homes uh, were so big you couldn't see out of the huge picture windows. And that, of course, created some problems. Uh, I think we have a solution for that at this point. Uh, we have been, um, through Sarah, been mandating um, beach grass planting and we had a, a lot of strenuous objections to that in the beginning. Um, but a funny thing happened. Once people started actually being successful with beach grass plantings, they found that all of a sudden the sand was not building up in front of their, in front of their picture windows. And so there's just a lot going on. This, this is a very dynamic uh, issue. Uh, beaches and dunes are always going to be moving. Uh, ocean policy changes constantly. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, so after hearing Jonathan Allen with Dogami, uh, we're, we're so glad that uh, we got the legislature to reverse uh, funding for Dogami, which we feel is extremely important for a lot of the work that they do. Uh, I've been working with Peter Rogerio for, for many years. Uh, we started, oh God, this was years ago, with the Tillamook Coastal Futures Project. And I noticed there are many, many people on this call uh, that also were involved in that original Tillamook Coastal Futures Project. So uh, again, I'm, I'm not sure what I can add to this conversation, um, but being on OPAC, I'm a member of OPAC. I'm the North Coast Commissioner Representative on the Ocean Policy Advisory Council. And I'm sure many of you remember the work that we did uh, for the Territorial Sea Plan Part 5 uh, um, ocean energy issues. Um, I, again, it's a dynamic system and we have to keep working at it. Uh, as we all know uh, from the Department of Land Conservation Development, um, coastal planning, all planning in Oregon is top down. It comes from the Department of Land Conservation Development. Uh, there are many arguments out there that that may or may not be the best way to do things. Uh, but at the same time, we keep Oregon, Oregon by having this top down planning. Uh, are, are there issues maybe that we can change? I think so. Um, but so far, I think it, it's worked quite well. I think we're all happy with with what we see. Are there are there ways to improve the system? Yes, I think there are also. So, again, this this is a. a Dynamic system, something that we're going to have to continue to uh, to work on. Uh, and with that, I'll, I'll just leave it at that and answer any questions that anyone might have. So, Sarah, I'm going to give you back a lot of time. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, so, I guess before we jump into questions, I'll just kind of tie a little bit of this up from um, all the great panelists that we heard from this evening. So, really, when we talk about um, activities and how they're regulated through goal 18 and how that um, helps shape uh, development and those parameters within your community. 
So Nascoin is a built-in committed community. There was an exception taken uh, when we developed the comprehensive plan for Tillamook County years ago. And Nescalin, even though it's subject uh, in many areas to ocean flooding, uh, development has been continued to be allowed because of a special exception. So in goal 18, there are five implementation measures, and these are basically objectives, rules, and guidance that are reflected in our comprehensive plan. So they tell us where and how we can develop and where we have to protect. And these five implementation measures, two of them that are very important to NESCO and as a community uh, in relation to development are implementation measure two and implementation measure five. Implementation measure two is the measure that prohibits residential, commercial, and industrial development on properties that uh, are that contain a specific dune classification and that are subject to ocean flooding. And um, as you know, uh, and Jonathan can speak more to this, the dune classifications within the community of Nescoan are not those stabilized dune classifications that allow development outright. So because these are dune classifications that um, continue to be dynamic, and are susceptible to ocean flooding in order to allow development within the community, an exception, so a goal exception essentially to implementation measure two was required for the community. And this was granted because Nesco and the community of Nesco was considered to be a built and committed area decades ago. Um, within our goal 18 element of the comprehensive plan, if you look through the table of contents, there's many areas that talk about Nesco and and towards the end of this um, goal 18 element, it actually lists by map and tax lot those properties that are allowed to be developed through that exception or what would be, I guess I would almost call it a variance in simplified terms to that implementation measure to prohibition. With that, much of Nescoin, because it was developed prior to January 1st, 1977, has been eligible for riprap. So that's not something that can occur everywhere. There's a definition under state law that determines eligibility for what properties can be riprap that are oceanfront, that are experiencing ero excuse me, erosion. And unless the property meets that definition, uh, they would have to go through a goal exception to actually be able to um, riprap their property. Fording management, so Jay talked a lot about uh, fording grading. So this is something that people will do in some areas uh, for view protection or enhancement. Uh, you have to have a fording management plan that has been adopted and acknowledged by both the local jurisdiction and DLCD in order to conduct fording grading activities. The fording grading is where you reduce the height of the fording so that you have a better ocean view, which in this one, I know that sounds a little crazy because I'm pretty sure most of you would love to have a fording in front of your properties. But other areas like Pacific City that are experiencing uh, accretion, that uh, ability to manage the height of their fording for view protection is very important to them. There's only a couple of areas throughout Tillamook County as a whole where that type of grading activity is allowed. And so that's another piece of goal 18. There are um, opportunities for remedial grading, which is where you don't lower the height of the fording, but essentially you're pushing the sand away from the foundation of the property. And so it is recognized through goal 18 that there needs to be some sort of dune management, not only for stabilization and protection, of the dune itself, but also for development that may be located on the dune. And so that's something that can occur everywhere, but that and the fording grading, if that is allowed in areas, requires joint permitting from both the county and the Oregon Parks and Recreation Department. One of the most important things I think that we will continue to focus on as we move into the future and we look at things like sea level rise is how do we 
better protect our boarding systems, which essentially are our best and greatest protection to erosion and ocean flooding. And that's where great partners like Jonathan Allen and Dr. Rosario and Meg and from DLCD and OPRD come in is because we all work very, very closely together to look at what are the best ways possible to help reduce risk and increase community resiliency. So there's a lot that goes into goal 18. It is a very important goal to our county, especially with our coastal communities. And um, you can read more about that by going to the goal 18 element of the Tillamook County Comprehensive Plan. And in fact, you can do a word search for NESCOIN, which is the quickest way to find all those snippets about how, what the relationship is between NESCOIN and goal 18, but also you see um, administration of those goals and policies uh, implemented through um, the Beach and Dune Hazard Overlay Zone and requirements for Beach and Dune Hazard Reports for development. The NESCO and Coastal Hazards Overlay Zone uh, incorporates and folds in a lot of those Goal 18 policies and prohibitions. Um, the Geologic Hazard Report section, uh, even though it's not tied to the Beach and Dune element of our comprehensive plan, there's a lot of development in areas that may be uh, an area of known geologic hazard and also we're dealing with in that beach and being over in that zone. So that's, um, those are the tools that we have along with the maps that Dagami and others provide to help us do our job and uh, fulfill our commitment and responsibility to making sure that development occurs uh, in a responsible way that helps reduce risk and uh, is for the benefit of public health, welfare, and safety. So uh, I guess we'll open it up to questions now. And I see there's quite a few in the chat, which is very exciting. So Chris, would you like to lead the questions um, or would you like me to do that? Uh, sure. We have one from Guy Sievert. Um, what's the most likely scenario uh, for Nesquin? after a, an earthquake off the Oregon coast, will we be uplifted or sink relative to the ocean? So um, the modeling that we have done, um, uh, which is guided by uh, doing very detailed uh, studies, looking at cores within various estuaries up and down the Oregon coast, um, and we have very detailed records going back about 6,000 years in these estuaries. And uh, when, you, when you look at those uh, cores and you look at the relationship between uh, tsunami sands that appear on top of buried soils, uh, the general indi indications are that uh, we can expect anywhere from about two feet of subsidence in a moderate a uh, Cascadia event, and that would be something akin to what happened in, in 1700. So this is still a very big event, uh, resulting in about two feet of subsidence, uh, increasing to maybe as much as six feet in a more extreme, what we consider to be our XXL um, scenario. And as you go along the Oregon coast, um, these numbers vary quite substantially. Um, uh, as you get down to the south coast, the degree of subsidence is significantly greater, almost twice as much as what you experience on the north coast. Um, so these numbers are very significant. Um, I mean, the way to think of it is it's, it's basically like raising sea level instantaneously. And obviously that will have very significant, you know, irrespective of the damage caused by the tsunami and the earthquake, um, just the, the fact that the ocean level will have been raised long-term along this coastline, that will have very significant impacts on uh, the stability of the ocean beaches and dunes. Effectively, it's like, like thinking of it of uh, result of, of causing sea level rise in, instantaneously. And so obviously our beaches and dunes are going to respond to that um, in very uh, rapid, at very rapid rates as it erodes and uh, moves sands about to, you know, attempt to try to come into a new form of equilibrium 
uh, with the rise in sea level and then obviously the extreme conditions that we experience um, in our regular winter seasons. Great. Thank you, Jonathan. The next question is also from Guy and it's directed to Jay. Uh, what criteria do you use when balancing shoreline protection versus beach access north and south? Good question. So uh, our evaluation criteria for uh, ocean shore alterations, including riprap, are found in Oregon Administrative Rule 736, Chapter 20-0025, which is uh, and 0020. So the standard itself reads like this. For recreational use, the project shall not be a detriment to public recreation use opportunities within the ocean shore area, except in those cases where it is determined necessary or legally required to protect sensitive biological resources such as a state or federally listed species. And the other criterion is the project shall avoid blocking off or obstructing public access routes within the ocean shore, uh, except in those cases where it's detriment, uh, it is deemed, is determined and necessary or legally required to protect sensitive biological resources such as state or federally listed species. And there's also one in section 0025 uh, on obstructional hazards, the standard is, the project shall minimize obstruction to pedestrians or vehicles going on or along the ocean shore area. So when we look at a permit request, we look at the design of the structure and we determine how far that structure is gonna project out onto the shoreline. And if it's a very narrow shoreline at that location and it's a very large structure that's going to block access at high tide, we would be obligated in our evaluation to determine that it doesn't meet the criterion and that would be the basis for a permit denial. So the challenge is always going to be in areas where we have a narrow beach where we could have a problem with the beach being blocked, the engineer who designs this type of uh, structure would be challenged with trying to make it steeper uh, to minimize that encroachment um, and there may be other areas where there might be riprap to the north or south of it that does project out. We would wanna see that this particular project doesn't go any further or exacerbate existing impediments uh, to using the shoreline for access. Did that, did that answer your question, Guy? Can I, Chris, is it all right to follow up? Sure, yes. So uh, Jay, um, when, uh, do you, uh, consider evidence that uh, the hardening uh, of the shoreline uh, produces some scouring and, and loss of sand, especially in places like Mescuin where we're already losing sand. Uh, is that take, does that come into uh, to the criteria, something that you factor in? That yeah, I mean, sure, we look at the 10,000 foot view. So, you know, obviously Nesquin has seen its beaches shrink over the decades, I have a close friend of mine whose family has a beach house there and he recalls being a teenage or preteen being out in the dunes, the vegetated dunes before riprap was ever needed there. And his mom would have to ring a dinner bell so the kids could hear it to come in from the dunes. And so we know that the beach is shrinking at Nesquin. We know it's not likely that we're gonna have a big vegetated dune out there out in front of where the riprap is now. I mean, uh, Jonathan might wanna speak to that, but we kind of look at the big picture like, okay, uh, would we deny a riprap application for Nesquin right where the riprap ends, right? The next guy needs it. I don't know, that is, it, this is a difficult uh, thing to evaluate and we have to, we have to try to do the best we can with the tools and the criteria we have in reviewing these. And I also, I wanna mention that public comments and public participation are a large component of our permit reviews. and. We have a 30 day public comment period on every uh, ocean shore alteration permit we receive. And so we welcome and encourage the community members and the neighbors and interested parties and stakeholders to give us their public comments. If they have concerns about a particular project that they express those concerns, which, are, which we do consider. We also uh, accept public hearing requests on every application. And if we get 10 or more public hearing requests, then we'll schedule and hold a public hearing 
subsequent to the initial public comment period. So there's an opportunity for people who have concerns about these type of projects to weigh in and tell us what they think. Uh, one, one of the uh, sections of the rule tells us that we have several factors to consider in addition to the actual standards and criteria. And those factors include public opinion. So uh, I guess I would encourage you guy, if you're really interested uh, in, this, in these issues to become active and encourage your neighbors and friends to become active and participate in these permit decisions. Those comments do not fall on deaf ears. We do consider carefully the uh, comments we that we do receive during the public comment period. And we have, a, of course, a, a local committee that looks at land use issues and other things and, and gives people an opportunity to comment. And I'm not sure if they're receiving you know, it, I, I don't know what the communication is, uh, you know, between state parks and our community when you do have a permit request. And that's something we can work out offline and, and there sure. are people who will be very interested in that. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, so, so yeah, to follow up on that comment, Guy, uh, you can contact me and I can get you in touch with our uh, permit specialist who works with me on these permits. And you can get on an email list and every time there's an ocean shore alteration permit, either in your area or statewide, we'll email you a, a public notice if you're interested in receiving those. That's great, thanks, Jay. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you, Jay. Uh, another question came in, is the long, long view understanding provided by the adaptation plan that Nesquin will have to migrate uphill and leave the dune to the ocean and have the dune return to a more wild place? So I don't know who wants to take take on that question. So I'll, I'll offer a few comments, and and I think um, you heard very clearly from Peter in his uh, video, and that this is a very challenging subject. Um, it's challenging from a variety of different standpoints. Um, obviously, there are some very significant uh, political social issues related to relocating an entire community out of an area that you know it's been been in for some time i mean that that takes big decisions to to go down that path and and it should be whatever those decisions are you know that really needs to be discussed at the local level um so obviously that needs to be guided by good science and while we have excellent data about what's happening on a seasonal basis to interannual basis to even decadal multi-decadal time frames um, there's still a lot of uncertainty as to how the beaches will respond as you know change continues to to happen um, i.e. through sea level rise. There's still a tremendous amount of uncertainty as to the scale of the uh, sea level rise that's that's being forecasted. And, you know, I pointed this out, even in an eight year period, our forecasts have changed fairly significantly and in all likelihood will continue to change significantly going into the future. So I think, you know, those are, those are, these are topics that are, important to start having the conversation about. Um, do we have the science that actually supports the move right now? I think it's probably early days. And, and Peter alluded to this in that our knowledge of sort of multi-decadal responses are still uh, very much a long way out there. Um, you know, we can document a, a well-established net northward drift of sand over the last two decades, and there's some evidence that this may have been going on even longer than that. But the uncertainty is whether that will actually reverse. And so Pacific City could become the future Nesquan, and uh, Nesquan become obviously uh, in a better place with more sand. I mean, we, we, don't, we don't really know at this stage. If you want a more of a professional opinion, uh, my sense is that that reversal is probably less likely, um, but it's a possibility. I mean, we would have to see a major shift in our prevailing storm climatology to 
uh, really start to move that sand back to the south and bring some uh, better stability to the Nesquen area in the future. I'll stop there. Thanks, thanks, Jonathan. Uh, a related question. Uh, is there a timeline that would help us understand how soon we would need to adapt uh, moving off the dune? So I think I, I indicated to this, I think it's early days at this stage. I mean, obviously there's a lot more uh, work still needs to be done to better understand uh, how our beaches uh, and dunes will respond to future forcing. And the, the big unknowns obviously is, is the wave climate. I mean, are we expecting uh, the wave climate to remain pretty much what we see now? Uh, certainly the modeling that I've seen suggests that what we experience now is probably what it's going to be like in the future. Uh, there's some new science that's suggesting that um, uh, the incidence of El Ninos could potentially uh, become more frequent in the future. If that were to happen, then uh, the situation uh, starts to look worse for uh, some of our communities, particularly communities like Nesquim, because El Ninos typically impact the south ends of our littoral cells, uh, erodes those south southern ends, removes that sand offshore, and then moves some of that sand further northward. So if we tend to see more El Ninos happening in the future, then in all likelihood, we could expect to see more erosion happening at the south ends of our littoral cells. It's, you know, it's, it's complicated. All right, great, thank you. Sarah, I believe that's, uh... That's all I'd just the like questions to point out that we thing, have. If I might. So when it comes sure. to goal 18, again, we have to remember uh, that there are, and there's always two different camps here, but there are two principal objectives to goal 18. The first is to conserve, protect, and where appropriate, develop or restore the resources and benefits of coastal beach and dune areas. But then there is a second principal objective, and that is to reduce the hazard to human life and property from natural or human induced actions in these areas. So it's incumbent upon us to make that we, we do protect beaches and dunes, uh, but it's also incumbent upon us to protect human life and property. And I think we sometimes forget that second priority objective. Great, thank you, Commissioner. Sarah, would you like to close this out? Well, I just want to thank everyone for joining us this evening and thank you to Brenda, Chris, and Randall for putting this together and to thank our panelists. Uh, again, any uh, additional information you'd like about Goal 18, you can actually do a Google search for statewide planning Goal 18 and there is an excellent uh, condensed summary of what Goal 18 is uh, from a statewide uh, planning level. And then again, uh, visiting the community development homepage, you're going to click on the plus sign for planning. And if you look down that tab, you'll see comprehensive plan. Click on the goal 18 attachment, and then you can do a word search for NESCO in, and there's all kinds of interesting things that you'll find uh, in that document. And if you have any follow-up questions, thinking about all of the things we talked about this evening, so there's a lot of information please don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, if it's not, if it's a question that I cannot answer, uh, I have a great contact with all of our panelists this evening, especially Commissioner Yamamoto. Uh, and so I can uh, follow up and, and get answers back to the community if needed. So thank you everyone. Wonder, wonderful. And as a reminder, the session was recorded or is being recorded and it will be posted to the uh, Nesquen CAC website here shortly. Thanks again, everyone. Thank you. Have a great night. Thank you, Sarah. Bye-bye.